everyone. I'm Pamela Covage. I am the, um, the staff person at Putney Cares. Thanks for coming tonight. Um, just out for my own curiosity, how many of you, I'm interested in how you found out about this event, how many of you read it in either the Reformer or the Commons? Quite a few. How many of you saw a poster and that brought you here? A few. How else did you hear about it? Did people tell you? The library desk. The library desk. How many people from the library? A few. Okay, great. Good. Thanks. Good. And I Putney. Great. Thanks for saying that. Yes. Excellent. Good. So um, I've got, we put some promotional materials from Putney Cares on this little table right over here. Um, so please help yourself if you want. There's a brochure. Um, there's also a little info card on what we do. Um, we provide um, Meals on Wheels, we loan medical equipment, we give rides to folks who um, don't have transportation to medical appointments, and we have exercise and art classes in our facility up on Kimball Hill. So um, more information about Putney Cares is on the table if you want it. Um, there's also um, free advanced directive um, booklets um, that, were, uh, that we have at Putney Cares and I neglected to bring last week for those of you who were here. If you don't have an ad advanced directive and you would like one, the form is inside this booklet and it is um, informational. Please help yourself. Um, there's, um, so there's a little bit of, this is in conflict with what we're doing next week, but um, Joanna Reuter, who presented about advanced directives um, last week, is doing a program next week um, at the same time as our program for those of you who are in Brattleboro and may not want to come to our program, and there are flyers for that over there as well. Um, you can, if you want to sign up to be on the Putney Cares listserv and get emails from us, which are not too frequent, but announce what's happening at Putney Cares, you can sign up on the clipboard over there. Um, and what else do I have here? Oh, and Putney Cares is doing um, a sharing housing workshop at our activities barn on Kimball Hill Sunday. There's a flyer um, I'm going to leave over on the table presented by Anna Marie Pluhar, who lives in Dummerston and is, um, knows a lot about sharing housing if you or somebody you know might be interested in figuring out how to share your house. So that's the news from Putney Cares. I'm going to introduce Louise Garfield, who is going to introduce Jonathan. Louise is, is among the group of people who coordinated um, this Death Matter series. So thanks to you all for coming. Okay. Again, thank you for coming. How many of you were here last week for our first talk? And you, so maybe you know by now that there's a series of four talks, this being the second. Um, before I introduce Jonathan, I'll mention that next week we have Mark Kenny, who has worked in the funeral service industry for quite some time, but bailed out of it because he found there to be some distasteful practices and a certain amount of greed. So he's ready to talk, tell us everything he wanted to know about funeral planning and um, perhaps some alternatives that are available that he may not have heard of. So we hope you can come to that. There are flyers up there. And then I'll just turn this right over to Jonathan. He's put his name up here, his title, um, and, and we'll focus on the avoidance of common estate planning mistakes. He practices in Brattleboro, and he's the president of the Vermont chapter of the Elder Law Attorneys. So I'm considering him an expert, and he will take us, take us through many details. Go ahead, Jonathan. Get some lights off here. Mm -hmm. What do you think? Mm -hmm. I can do this. Yeah, I'll, I'll get the ones that are over here if you want to get those. Do we yeah. like Don't this make it too dark or they'll fall okay. right asleep on you. <laughs> <laughs> That's perfect. Okay. Um, thank you for coming. I'm, I'm, I'm impressed that people can come at 7 o'clock at night to talk about death and taxes and funeral planning and advanced directives. But you know, they're important topics and they're often things we don't hear about. So um, the focus of my practice, unlike a lot of attorneys in the area and generally, is estate planning, probate, probate being after somebody dies, uh, dealing with the process through the, the probate court um, to pass assets from, from the decedent on in accordance with their will or their trust or beneficiary designations or other documents. The point is anybody can, can go online, pay $25 or whatever it is, and draft a simple will and think, well, there, I've, I've taken care of my estate planning. 
But there's a lot more to it, and there's a lot that you don't necessarily, you don't know, you don't know. Uh, to paraphrase Rumsfeld. Um, the, we'll go briefly over some of this. As I was saying earlier, this is an overview. Um, I, I, my, part of my goal, I didn't say, I think, is for everybody to get um, something out of this. And I think as we go through, um, you will. But we'll start simple and we'll get more complex. Um, and, and a lot of the simple things, maybe you thought you, did, you knew them and maybe you don't know them as well as you could. So the three basic documents are the will, the durable general power of attorney, and the advanced directive for healthcare. Um, Joanna spoke about the advanced directive for healthcare, and we won't spend much time on that. But the durable general powers of attorney designate an agent to handle your financial affairs. It's got nothing to do with healthcare unless it's a situation where you know you're putting you know mom is being admitted into a nursing home and the advanced directive may cover her medical care but it doesn't cover the admission by the way a trap for the unwary if you ever sign and i've seen this recently a lot of nursing homes will try to have the child sign the entry form as the responsible party Aww. don't do it your, your mother or your father the person who's getting admitted is the responsible party. Ideally, you have a dur durable general power of attorney and you're signing it as their agent. So then you sign their name as the responsible party and then you can say bye and you sign your name. Um, you know, around here, the nursing homes, most of which are nonprofit, are generally not going to be that um, manipulative. Um, but I've definitely heard some stories about people getting into a lot of trouble out of the best of intentions of just trying to, to get mom admitted that day. Um, so we'll talk a little bit more about the advanced directive for healthcare, but one of the one of the issues comes up, you know, how do you how do you name your agent? And you have a few different options. First of all, there are there are two kinds of general durable power durable general powers of attorney. <coughs> the first is what's called a springing power of attorney. And I'll, I'm going to, you know, meander off my slides a fair amount, so don't worry too much about keeping track. The springing power of attorney springs into effect upon a triggering event. Most often that's a physician signing something saying, Mr. So-and-so is officially incapacitated. I, I hereby declare he has no capacity, and therefore you, the agent, can now act. In theory, that sounds great, and people think, well, that way I'm, I'm protected from somebody taking this document and stealing all my money. But the reality is, I've, I've had one case of a child stealing all of mom's money, and we can talk about that. But, but the, that, what I've had more problems with is, you know, dad has good days and bad days, and, you know, the child is starting to help uh, with the, the books, maybe doesn't do it um, to the exclusion of dad, but... Everybody knows dad needs help. And um, a physician on a particular day may not be willing to certify that dad is incapacitated. So the vast majority of um, durable powers of attorney that I draft for clients, and it's a client's choice what they prefer. I like to bring this up as an option, but the vast majority of mine are not springing powers. They go into effect immediately. I hereby name my spouse as my agent to handle all of my financial affairs for me. Um, and it goes into effect right away. And if my spouse is unable or unwilling, I hereby name this other person, my child, my friend. Um, because I find that in the situations I have, there's a lot of sort of great transitional period where it's really just helpful to have somebody else. Even if the person hasn't healed over with a stroke, we see so much dementia now, um, it's really helpful to have somebody in place to be able to do that. So the advanced directive for healthcare, um, lawyers like to make things more difficult than they need to be. So it really, as Joanna and I have talked about, it really consists legally of two things. It is the power of attorney for healthcare. If people say power of attorney, it's sometimes not clear if they're talking about for health or for finances that we just talked about. Um, so it's the power of attorney where you say, if I'm incapacitated, and that there you do have to be incapacitated. This is the person who will make the decision for me based on what they know, hopefully in line with the, um, the living will, which is the guidance that that person has. And that guidance can be, depending on how it's drafted, more or less uh, directive. It can say, here's in general what my wishes are, and I want you 
you know, I, I would hope that you take those into consideration, or it could be, you know, if I have a white blood cell count of 37 and a half, pull the plug. I mean, really the gamut. Um, and, and they're very personalized documents, which is why it's great that um, you had gone out to was it Wisconsin yeah. to get the training. There, there's, there's really interesting work happening now around cost savings and patient satisfaction and family satisfaction, all based on doing an informed consent and setting up an advanced directive ahead of time and thinking about these issues. And I have yeah. a question. People often ask me, so what's the difference between the advanced directive and this? The advanced directive is an umbrella term that covers the power of attorney for health care and the living will. These actually used to be separate documents, and sometimes you still see that, but sort of the current uh, uh, custom, if you will, is just to, and, and, and this is reinforced by the statutory language, is to combine it in one and say, this is my advanced directive. And it really, if you pull it apart, it, it consists of those two pieces. Does that help? Yes, yeah, so somebody, some people, when they come to me, say, I have a living will. Mm -hmm. Do I need to do the Vermont Advanced Directive? What is your answer? Uh, my answer is, can I see it? Uh -huh. uh, because I've seen people who just have the power of attorney, um, and that can be okay. I think legally that's probably the most important. Uh, or I see people more problematically who just have the living will. Say, this is what I'd like to have happen, but there's nobody legally empowered to make that decision for them. And if you don't have that, and it becomes an issue, a lot of times the hospitals will say, you know what, we're just going to keep the person alive, um, status quo, until you get a court order telling us who we should listen to. Um, and by the way, the, by the way, our previous slide about the durable general power of attorney, it's the banks and the institutions who, you know, it's such a simple document to have an attorney prepare, and, and that one should be prepared by an attorney, I think, more than, than the healthcare directive. Um, but it's such a, a simple document, and if you don't have it, and the person has a stroke, and tomorrow somebody needs, even a spouse, needs to talk to a bank or a broker or an insurance company, they will often say, you know what, we, we won't even tell you whether we have an account with this person and, and unless you go and get a court-ordered guardianship. And on an emergency basis, I've had people at the retreat trying, and we're trying to get an emergency guardianship. You know, you're lucky if you can get it in a week. Um, or in the hospital. So, so these are really simple but important documents. And frankly, sometimes, you know, in my world of, of, of the estate planning, um, I think the advanced, uh, sorry, the durable general power of attorney for financial affairs may be the, more important than will, and maybe, depending on the circumstances, more important than the advanced directive. Just because if you don't have it, you know, if you don't have an advanced directive, but everybody gets along, everybody knows what you want, and the hospital's local, and they're willing to listen to the spouse, it can be fine. If you don't have a durable general power of attorney, good luck talking to the bank and getting any information. And a guardianship is a hassle, it's expensive. Um, you know, you have to pay for an attorney, not just for the petitioner, assuming you use an attorney, but you need to get an attorney for your husband or your father to represent them to make sure that their interests are protected. All that can be avoided with just a, a fairly basic durable power of attorney. A couple questions, yeah. Oh, my question was if you had the living will, don't they have to respect that without necessarily having the power of attorney for health care? So say the, did everybody hear the question? If you have a living will, don't they have to respect that? So let's say your advanced, your advanced directive, your living will, says um, if, uh, if I'm in a terminal state, I, uh, you know, I authorize my agent to withhold artificial nutrition and hydration, the primary purpose of which is to prolong my life, um, and, and I want them to take into consideration my quality of life. So child number one says, pull the plug. Child number two says, no, don't pull the plug. And if you pull the plug, I'm going to sue every one of you doctors. If you have an advanced directive that actually names child number one or child number two, um, that gets you, in most instances, around that problem. Um, you know, child number two can still sue, but they have less grounds to stand on and they're less likely to. So if it's your own wish to pull the plug, your children can interfere with that? Sure, anybody can interfere with that. Well, some people have more standing than others. But, um, 
Okay. Yeah, I mean, you know, so, you know, Terry Schiavo, if everybody remembers that, it wasn't that long ago. Um, you know, her husband, I think, said, look, I was married to her. Terry did, would not want to be in a comatose state for all these years. And her parents hired lawyers and brought suit and said, no, she would have wanted that. And so, you know, it's, it's not always clear to a court what she would have wanted. And, and, the, and it makes it more important for you to spell this out. But if she had a signed living will, that's not clear enough? The, the better the, the living will has been done, mm -hmm. um, the more compelling it is, the more it's going to hold up and forestall legal action in the first place. And I should say, you know, people, um, these are good conversations to have before that moment. So if you have kids, you know, it's not a bad idea to, I think it's important, I should say, to talk with them and say, look, this is what I want, this is what I don't want. Let there be no doubt. And if one child says, you know what, Mom, I really, because of my belie religious beliefs, I really don't think I could do that, then you know, okay, I'll name the other child as the agent, and you just let them know, look, this is, this is what's important to me. Um, I've had people not name their spouse as the agent because they say, you know, my spouse loves me too much. I'm going to pick this child who always hated me, <laughs> that, that teenage girl who never grew out of it, and, and who knows she can get at the money this way. You had a question. Um, validity in other states? You have an accident on vacation? As long as it's done validly in the state where you are a resident, it's valid in other states. Now, that's, that's the principle. Um, until just a few years ago, Dartmouth, Dart, uh, Vermont, uh, sorry, New Hampshire had a statute. This is what happens when you try to talk at 720. Um, New Hampshire had a statute saying unless your document specifically said, um, I authorize my agent to um, withhold artificial life support and hydration, and if started, discontinue. Their position and Dartmouth's position was, if it's already been started, then they can't stop it, even if you've made your wishes abundantly clear. So you do what you can. Um, try to try not to travel in the south if ill. Um, um, you, you do what you can, and and you try to make it as, your wishes as clear as possible. Okay. So, these are great questions, by the way. Thank you. <laughs> Everybody's getting better, and if if nothing else, I think the financial imperatives are driving a reconciliation finally with people wanting to be allowed to die naturally. John, if you had any experience sorry, yeah. with, the direct, with the registry. Oh, with thank you. Thanks for mentioning that, because I, I, I wanted to answer yeah. that question with that as well. Um, yeah, so there is an advanced directive registry in New Jersey, which has been contracted by Vermont. And there's a form, and when we do advanced directives for, our, for my clients, uh, we always give them this form. You can find it online. It's actually in the booklet. Oh, and it's in the booklet. Um, so basically, they will, they will record your, um, your advanced directive or whatever document you send them. Um, and it'll be part of your medical record, which I understand. I've never looked at the statute, but I understand hospitals in Vermont are required to check that. Um, whether or not they always do it isn't entirely clear. But at least in Vermont, um, and it's not uh, broadly, it, it's not interconnected to other states right now. But at least in Vermont, it's available um, if you show up after a car accident, they're supposed to be able to go online and look. One other little thing yeah. is that the sticker that goes on your license uh, has the phone number, and there anybody is supposed to check that, even if you're in Arizona. Uh huh. Well, that's great. Yeah, so, yeah. Whether they will. Yeah, but that's more notice anyway. That, that's helpful. Um, very briefly, people often ask about do not resuscitate orders, DNRs. Mm -hmm. That's different from an advanced directive. Um, the DNR ha is, isn't completed with your lawyer generally, it's completed with your physician. And there's a, a set of things they walk you through and have you sign. Um, but you have to be you know, in a, some, some, something towards a terminal state um, for, for it to be put into place. But a lot of people think that um, this will serve as a DNR, and it really doesn't. Um, so, you, you know, if that's a concern, of concern to a family, they need to talk to their doctor about that and make sure that's in place. I had one client who had that 
she had that um, taped to her front door. Because by God, she was not going to let those rescue people, you know, start going at her with the resuscitation. So everybody's different, but, um, but it is something to keep in mind. Yeah. Um, back to the power, a regular power of attorney for finance and so forth. Do you have to have a doctor's um, assurance that this, uh, do you have to, does the person who has um, got that power of attorney um, legitimate to go ahead and go to the bank and so forth without a doctor's okay, or is it just any time they can do it? Yeah, I had, I had talked the, about this a little person. bit earlier. The, the, it depends how the document is drafted. That was the springing versus non-springing power. So as, if the document says this goes into effect right now, which is how I generally like to do it, mm -hmm. or my clients like to have it done. No, you spoke about that earlier. But. Yeah, so that, that goes into effect without a doctor's certification yeah. that anybody's incapacitated. But, but if you want that added protection, you can have that in it. I don't remember doing that for my mother and going around to all the banks where she had some money a little here and a little there going around and, and collecting. But I know a doctor had said she was mm. um, not compass. I mean, that I had the uh, right to do that because she wasn't all there. You're not required to have that unless the document as you had it drafted requires that. Okay. Um, and by the way, if you're naming durable powers of attorney, um, sometimes it makes sense to name one agent, and if not that person, then another. Um, s rarely does it make sense to name two agents together because I find they have to both go to every bank meeting and be on every phone call. But what I do a lot is we'll say name spouse if living and available and willing. Otherwise, you pick two or three children, and, you, and then the document says on the face of it, either can a any one child can act independently of the other. And then they just show that to the bank and say, well, look, it says I don't have to get my siblings on the phone or in the bank, and so just follow my direction. That, that, that can be very effective. Okay. Um, there's HIPAA language in the advanced directive, um, which is helpful now. So then we come to the will. Um, it's the only will. Who needs a will? Uh, you know, everybody needs a will, but it becomes more important for some than others. A will is the only legal way to name guardian for guardians for minor children. So if you have children or great or, or, or grandchildren, um, and you know you're looking at well, should should I recommend that they do some estate planning? Maybe. Um, and and if they say well, you know, mom, I really don't have any assets. You know, it's it's just me and my child, and you know, I don't, I, you know, I'm, I'm broke because you never give me enough money. Um, at that point, you can always just emphasize that, that really it's important to name a guardian. If you don't, that guardianship nomination will serve as guidance for a judge who ultimately have to, has to decide. And if you don't, the judge is gonna take his best guess. And if you have family members fighting over it, that can be from, in a married situation from different families, that can just be an awful experience. So that's, that's a big reason. It's also the only way to convey probate property. So the best way to describe um, probate property. Well, I'll come back to that in the next. So a mixed family, by the way, um, a lot of people don't realize, but in a second marriage, um, or any marriage for that matter, you're not entitled, you're not legally allowed to completely disinherit your spouse. So even if in your will you say, I give everything to my kids from the first marriage because my spouse is a billionaire and I'm not, um, unless you got a prenuptial agreement before you got married, then your surviving spouse after your death can do what's called taking against the will or an election against the will and say, you know what? I'm entitled under the statute to half of everything my spouse has. So I'm going <coughs> to check this box in probate and, um, and I'm going to get my half. And it happens all the time. Um, so you can protect against that with a prenup or, as we'll see, you can protect against it with a trust. Um, so then going back to what's not probate property. That election, by the way, it's clear that it happens in probate. It's clear that what property your will governs is subject to that spousal election. It's really not clear in Vermont whether it, and there's a good argument that it doesn't, 
apply to any non-probate transfers. So let's talk about what I mean by non-probate transfer. So the first kind of asset that doesn't pass under your will, that doesn't pass, therefore, through probate, is jointly owned property. So a husband and a wife own the house together. Um, husband dies, and assuming they own it as tenants by the entirety is for married couples. These two are, are pretty much the same, but tenants by the entirety is for married people, and joint tenants with rights of survivorship is for two brothers who own a camp in, you know, up north. What this means is, if one of them dies, the whole thing goes to the other. Even if the first, even if they each said in their will, um, I, I want to give my half of the house to my kids, going back to the second marriage situation, it doesn't matter because it never gets into the will, it never gets to probate, because immediately upon one person's death it passes to the other. If, if the deed says tenants in common, so I own with my brother this camp, and I die, and the deed says tenants in common, or is silent, that's the default, then my half goes according to my will. And by the way, if you don't have a will, oftentimes it's not that big a deal, uh, because everything goes to your spouse uh, if you're married and all the kids are from, the spouse, from that spouse. Uh, otherwise, it goes equally to your descendants, uh, to your kids and so on down the line. Um, and then if you have a child from a different marriage, it's a different percentage. But, but this is, going back, this is jointly owned property doesn't pass under the will, even if you say so in your will. Everybody clear on that? The second set of property that passes, um, yeah. So if, um, did, is this just for, for property or for real estate or that kind of thing? What about a business? That's a good question. Um, it gets a little more complicated depending on how the business is owned. Mm -hmm. So, so um, the business is an S corp with two partners. An S corp with two partners. And is there a, um, written, agreement uh, bylaws of the corporation that talks about what happens if one dies so in a situation like that that would be a probate asset okay mm -hmm. um, and so what you can do is you can if you're set if that's not the outcome you would want um, then you can set you can set up a revocable trust which we'll talk about and assign your shares in that business into that trust okay and then your trust can govern who gets that and there's other variations depending on how the business is owned. Property with designated beneficiaries. So if you have an IRA and you name child or spouse or whoever you name as your beneficiary, or, or life insurance. If you name beneficiaries on life insurance, that passes to those beneficiaries immediately through essentially a contract with that company. And it doesn't go through your will. So more and more I'm seeing, and, and we all see, clients where the bulk of their assets are our retirement accounts and, and or life insurance you know I had a well so so, so I'll come back to that um, so, so this is a critical um, piece about estate planning everybody thinks it's all about the will less and less is it about the will more and more it's about these beneficiary designations um, and then the third kind of property is property that's in trust if you take your house and or your investment account and you put it into your trust that you set up before your death, the day after your death, it's still in that trust. And so it wasn't owned by you individually. It was in that trust. And then your trust acts as a will, but outside of the whole probate process. We'll talk about that some more. Yeah. Um, this may be out of order in terms of when you want to talk about it, but uh, the IRA situation, I read something recently that I meant to remember, of course I didn't, uh, but it seemed to be saying to be very careful that you didn't do something if your spouse <coughs> died so that that IRA came to you and you didn't have, if there was something you could do wrong that would then have tax consequences. If within the time window, I want to say it's 120 days, but I, I, I'm not sure. If you fit, it's probably more than that, but if you fail to, to roll that over into your own name, you'll miss the window. There are so many traps for the unwary around IRAs. Okay. I went to a seminar up north 
a couple weeks ago where we paid um, the, uh, th this association on the matter of paid a fortune to the national expert on IRAs. This woman who, who uh, you know, makes a fortune. She's at a big Boston firm. Her sole job is trying to explain to attorneys the IRA rules. Mm -hmm. it, is, it is inordinately complicated. <laughs> and she says, the first thing she says is, you know, she, she says, I write Congress every year with detailed recommendations. And I say, please put me out of business because I make too much money trying to figure out and explain these rules. Nobody can follow them. But there are a lot of traps. So when after a death, it's really important to find the most senior person you can in, at Vanguard or Fidelity or whatever organization or your broker and, and start laying a paper trail for what happens um, you know, in terms of rolling over the way you want. And there, there are huge consequences to those decisions in terms of tax deferral, um, mainly in terms of tax deferral. That's sort of the name of the game. So um, I, have, I have a small slide on that later. Are there questions on that? Um, Non-probate transfers. So these beneficiary designations, um, for example, they're easy, they're cheap, they're quick. You don't have to pay a lawyer to do them. They can work out great in the right situation. Uh, you, don't need, you don't even need a will. Just name beneficiaries on all your accounts. Um, and sometimes I recommend clients do that a lot of times. It really, if everything's straightforward, it's nice to avoid it. Whoops. But here are the risks. You may forget that you had a life insurance policy as recently happened, well, about a year ago to one of my clients. Uh, it was a recent marriage. Um, her husband died unexpectedly. Uh, they were very happily married for a short period of time. Uh, and he, he basically died insolvent. And so she had to take out a loan to pay the funeral expenses, which I believe she's still paying. Uh, meanwhile, the $50,000 life insurance policy went to his brother, with whom he hadn't spoken in 18 years. Because he'd forgotten that he named his brother as the beneficiary, and when he got married or at other points, he didn't think to check it. And going back to that early slide I had said at the beginning, of, or the, the video, that's an example of what you, you might not know that you weren't knowing. Um, and he refused when asked to help pay for the funeral. So she's still paying off that debt. Um, so, so another problem is there's no court supervision. We do a lot to try to avoid, I help the clients a lot to avoid probate. Sometimes probate can be a good thing. If you have, under certain circumstances, you have some heirs who are fighting, if things get difficult, sometimes it's not a bad idea to have a referee in place, the judge, who can exert his influence. Um, you don't always, it's not always the best to avoid probate. Um, another important thing, if you're just relying on beneficiary designations, it can skew the distribution of an estate. What I mean by that is, I have a client now this is an elderly person who doesn't have the capacity to redo her will. And her will, which was done long before I was involved with her, gives, she has a lot of land. And it gives this parcel to that child, that parcel to that grandchildren, this bank account to that child. Um, and the problem is, half of the land has been sold. Mm. Which means mm -hmm. that the $400,000 parcel that that child was supposed to get isn't around anymore. And that child is going to get nothing. And she can't fix it because she doesn't have the capacity. So there, there are some real benefits in, to, to avoiding probate, but you have to be really careful in your doing that. And you have to remember, OK, I put aside a $300,000 CD for that one child, and I've got this other CD for that child. And now if I take 5000 out of that, I have to take 5000 out of that. It's, it's a hard way to plan. It puts a lot of pressure on you. And oftentimes, you're, you're much better off to the extent that you're relying on this by, you know, take one account and on every account, if you've got three kids, just say equally to those three kids. And you do that for every single account. Um, or you have a whole lot more flexibility with the trust. And we'll talk about that. Isn't this stuff fun? I really <laughs> like that. Um, this is sometimes, I've heard this called the Vermont deed. It's adding, or I'm sorry, the Vermont will. It's adding your children or a child onto the deed. Um, it is usually, not always, but I think usually a bad idea with undue risk. 
So what can go wrong? You have one child, you say, you know what? I hate courts and probate. We're gonna avoid the whole thing. I'm just gonna add Jimmy on to the house and he'll get it when, when I'm gone. Um, problem is, what if Jimmy then gets sued? Or what if Jimmy gets divorced? He's a, a one half interest owner in your home. And that can turn out really badly. Um, what if Jimmy decides he doesn't like you anymore? And, or Jimmy has a personality change or mental illness or something. And all of a sudden, you know, he can, any one owner, an equal owner of a property can force what's called a partition. Because you can't be trapped in only owning land or real, real property, real estate with others. So any one owner can file an action in court. And if they don't get bought out by, in this case, dad, then uh, the, the, the court will force a sale and split the proceeds. Um, child can get divorced. I mentioned that. Uh, and they decide you don't, they don't like you anymore. Um, so the probate process in Vermont is actually not bad as things go. What we're seeing, frankly, in the last three or four years, they've consolidated the probate court with all the other courts, and it's taking longer and longer. We used to be a model of efficiency, and then they combined everything for efficiency, and it's, among us, it's, it's proving problematic. I mean, things I used to get in a week are now taking a month or two. Um, and they're just understaffed and underfunded, and there's a lot of, a lot of different reasons. That said, Vermont probate is still pretty good. You know, it, people say, oh, probate takes forever. Well, it, it really, you know, much of, I can, I can usually finish up an estate in six or seven months, um, and four months of that is just waiting from the time the judge opens the estate for the notice to creditors period to end, when that notice goes in the paper, and says any creditors have four months to make a claim, and if they don't, they're forever barred. By the way, do you know what happens if you don't publish that? You're not required to publish it. But if you don't publish that, then a creditor has three years to make a claim. So, you know, heaven forbid you distribute out everything, and then the hospital says, well, wait a minute, we're owed 100000 So it's, it's, it's a good idea to do if you think you might may be at risk. Um, in New York and California and some other states, Maryland, you know, attorneys get to charge as a percentage of the probate estate. Even if you made the simplest, you know, if you had a million dollar estate with two beneficiaries and everything goes equally to two of them and it's, it takes, you know, 20 hours to do the whole thing, some of these attorneys are making tens of thousands of dollars. Um, so Vermont, we can only charge reasonable fees primarily based on our time. So that's a good thing. Most of the states settle. I talk about that. Sorry if I'm blocking anybody here. Uh, probate court supervision. Again, that's a good or a bad thing depending on the circumstances. So if you don't want to go through probate and you want a lot of other advantages that come with trust, <coughs> trust can be very effective for a lot of different reasons in a lot of different situations. They're wonderfully flexible vehicles. Um, it's, it's, it's best thought of as a piggy bank or a, or a box. It's like, a, it's like setting up a small company. Um, and when, we say, when somebody says, I have a trust, usually they're talking about a revocable trust. They set it up, they can revoke it or amend it at any time. As a result, it's still that person's money. And these can be joint trusts between a, you know, a husband and wife usually. Or it can just be, or if there's a husband and wife, sometimes each will have a separate trust. Um, and there are reasons for doing one versus the other. Jonathan, yeah. can, can trusts be made with people who are not related by blood or marriage? Absolutely. Yep. yep. Um, and, and so it's, it's basically a shell. And sometimes people don't fund it, but that's a mistake I see all the time. Um, people pay good money to an attorney to draft a trust, a revocable trust that they can revoke or amend during their lifetime. Once you die, it becomes irrevocable and fixed. And then it's a lot harder to change the terms. Usually you have to go to the court or get everybody to agree. But, um, oh, I'm sorry, I lost my train of thought there. Your question was, Shows. can you do it with anybody, no, anybody else? Um, and, and so... Don't fund it. You were saying. Thank you. So if you don't fund it, um, it happens all the time. Uh, everybody has a will. And, and if you have a, a trust, typically you have what's called a pour-over will. The will says, if I have anything that ends up 
mistakenly or otherwise in probate, it goes through probate and at the end it pours over into the trust. And then the trust distributes out everything uh, based on, like a will, it's a non-probate substitute. Um, the, the problem is people don't fund it and then they die, meaning they don't title their assets, they don't deed their home into their trust, they don't title the bank account and the investment account into the trust. And then you lose, not, not all, but you lose the, maybe the best advantage of a trust, which is probate avoidance. Because then all these assets go through probate, and at the end the judge decrees it out. Whereas if you'd titled the assets in the trust, if you'd funded the trust, you would have avoided the whole probate process. Frankly, you know, if I'm Machiavellian about it or perceive it that way, I think a lot of it, you know, especially some of these out-of-town, out-of-state attorneys, and I see this in New York, they'll set a, a large estate up that way. And partly, sometimes I think it's just so they can get the probate fees and then put it over into the trust. And maybe they never told the client, now you should fund your trust. But hopefully not many people think that way. Yeah. I guess I'm not understanding what you mean by funding the trust. In other words, why would you have a trust if it, you didn't have these things listed? So, what, right. what, so what, what would a trust be if you didn't have? Well, it serves as, as a will at that point. So let's say... Um, let's say uh, I have all my assets and I want them to end up in a trust because I've got young children and I want those children not to be able to get at the money to demand it right away. So I want their funds held in trust. Um, and I don't want um, the probate court or other people walking into the probate court to know who I've given my money to. You have the assets go through the will. And, and then the will at the end just says it goes into your trust. And once that's done, the public part is done. And now the assets at that point, go get, the trust gets funded post-death at that point and post-probate. And at the end of the process, you end up with a trust that says, okay, my kids can't get at the funds until they're much older. Um, that would be an example of ha still getting some of the benefits of it while not getting the probate avoidance benefit. Does that make sense? Yeah, I guess. I'm not sure. You know, yeah. maybe when it is, you talking about Yeah. Or, okay, so speaking personally, I don't have, I do what I, what I rarely advise clients to do, which is I have what's called a testamentary trust for, for my family, meaning um, I rely on beneficiary designations between me and my spouse, but for the kids, um, I haven't set up a revocable trust. I have that trust contained in the will. At that point, then all my assets, if my wife and I died leaving kids, all of our assets would go through probate, and then they'd end up in trust. And, and that way, the kids are still protected. They can't get at the money until they're much older, and there are some other benefits to it. The only reason I did it that way is that I know that I'm going to change my mind a lot between now and when I am hopefully die many years later, and I just don't want to have like a 60th amended trust. Um, you know, so, I mean, you don't have to do it that way. It's, it's almost an aesthetic thing. I'd like it cleaner. But, um, but, 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 you know, probate avoidance at that point, I don't really care about. <laughs> I'm dead. My wife's dead. Yeah. Uh, if you have older children and you have them as beneficiaries and all your IRAs and your bank accounts and everything, and then you have a will leaving your property to them, do you need a trust? You don't need a trust. So let me talk about some of the benefits of the trust. And if, if I don't fully answer your question, then yell at me or raise your hand. Um, so revocable trust, testamentary trust is what I talk about where the trust is in the will, but again, that won't avoid probate. You know, 90%, 95% of the trusts I do are freestanding um, revocable trusts with a pour over will that goes into it. Um, life insurance trust used to be more common <coughs> before the federal estate tax threshold went up. Um, that was, you take a whole bunch of money, you buy a life insurance policy, and then at your death, that life insurance policy, every year you, you pay the premium out of your own money, that whittles down your taxable estate. So at your death, your kids inherit the million dollar life insurance trust policy, and it's not part of your taxable estate. You don't see those so much anymore. Special needs trusts, I do a lot of. It's a whole other world of, of planning for, for people who have special needs, whether it's handicapped people or people with mental illness or a whole wide range of people and, and special needs trusts, I guess maybe I'm sort of thinking off the top of my head, the, the two 
maybe, maybe there's two big advantages that come to mind. One is it doesn't allow, let's say, a child to get at those funds. They have to get them from a trustee. I mean, that's, that's not so much a special needs trust, it's just a trust set up that way. Um, and a lot of times these are vague terms anyway. But what people usually mean when they're talking about a special needs trust is one that is specifically drafted to say, if my child is receiving Medicaid and SSI, or my niece or my nephew or whoever I'm setting up this trust for, um, the trustee is not allowed to use any trust funds for anything the government would pay for. No um, food, no shelter, no medical costs. Um, but the trustee may use the funds in the trust for anything else, for education, for travel, for a new TV. And so long as that trust is properly drafted and it's, there's an art to it, it's tricky, and as long as it's properly administered, which is even harder, then the, the, the beneficiary can get all the benefits of public assistance while also getting these supplemental benefits. And upon that person's death, whatever remains in the trust can get distributed out to the other children, the other beneficiaries, or the other charities. So um, we, I see a lot of these. I do a lot of these. But that's another advantage of a trust, whether or not it avoids probate by the time you get there. Yeah. Could you say what are some of the typical things you own that would go into a trust? I think you've mentioned a house and bank accounts. Do you put your car in the trust? Do you put, um, I'm, I can't think of others right now, but you can. Yeah, so, so everybody here, what, what, what goes into a trust? I mean, ideally, it's pretty much everything. So you would transfer your interest in the home into the trust. If you have an LLC or a business, you transfer your interest in that business into the trust so that those avoid probate. You can put your car into the trust, and some people do. It's not such a big deal, I think, uh, for a lot of, in Vermont, because a lot of um, the statute allows, if, if that's the only probate asset, the judge will sign it over. Um, frankly, I think the easiest way to deal with a car for an elderly driver or an elderly owner is just to add a child onto the ownership. I've looked into it and had long talks with the, the DMV, and that seems to reduce the transfer taxes at death, make for the easiest transfer, and um, and actually reduce the often the, the insurance because now you've got a younger driver as a co-owner. Yeah. This may be not the right place, but um, I've been told that if you own property that basically has passed down from generations, so it almost has no value because the value was in 1903, it's better to have that property go through probate because then the children get a value assigned to the, you know, as opposed to having it go into a trust where it would just keep going. Right. Um, so, so what she's talking about is, is what we call the tax basis for a property. Mm -hmm. You know, let's say you own, <laughs> I've got a client now who his grandmother got um, some, some stocks like Exxon and, and Standard Oil in 1929 that he still has those shares. And so it was, it was like $3,000 worth then. Uh, it's now about $3 million. And if he sells those during his lifetime, he's going to pay capital gains on all of that growth. Now, capital gains are at a maximum marginal historical low rate of 20%. 15% uh, or 30%? 20%. Um, but if he dies owning that stock. All the, nobody ever pays tax on that gain. And his children inherit that uh, with a new stepped up basis, stepped up to the date of death value. And, and then if they sell it some point thereafter, they only pay capital gain potentially, and this is excluding a primary residence where you get a separate exemption, um, on the growth from the date of death. So, um, so oftentimes, people can really make a, a huge mistake by selling an asset if they just wait a little bit longer till it sell, till, till their death. Um, but that's not necessarily a question of whether or not to have it go through probate because there isn't really a difference whether the, the property passes at death via probate or via trust, there's no difference there. Um, so it's just a question, I think what they were getting at when they were talking about it is if it stays owned, whether that's, you know, in, in trust or not, and just passed on, 
if, if it gets gifted, if, 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 if instead of selling it, you gift that share to your kids, that original basis carries over. So that's, that can be what happens, whether or not it's in trust. And it just keeps passing down. And then if somebody is mis, you know, makes the mistake of selling it before their death, there's a ton of capital gains taxes. I'm just checking. Originally, we had talked about, um, about an hour and a half. But I wanted to make sure that people, what time do you all think I have to stop? What, what's that? When you're done. When I'm done, OK. <laughs> And, and if you get bored, just walk out and try to make a lot of noise like you're really annoyed. Um, so you're doing, this is fun, actually. You're doing a great job of asking questions. So thank you. Yeah. You did have handouts. Have situation oh, yeah. Have children and none of them have any special needs, like not I'm sorry, I missed the first part. Oh, you're back to you have grown children. Yeah. And you have them all been... under your, as your beneficiaries. Yeah. And none of them have special needs. Yeah. not like getting state or federal help. Uh -huh. um, and so all you really have, you have a very simple situation, you have your property and you have all your bank accounts and IRAs and have beneficiaries. Do you really need a trust if you have a will saying that my property is to be divided amongst my children? Yeah, so every situation is different. Yeah, um, and there's pros and cons to doing trust. And actually, let me, um, I, I didn't finish my pros and cons slide. Uh -huh. So hold on just a second. And, and, and then yell at me if I don't answer the question. Um, so, you know, the, the advantage, you know, there are people, I don't know if anyone's a fan of Susie Orman. She's on TV a lot. She, she basically says, you're an idiot if you don't have a revocable trust at your death. Now, she lives in California where the attorneys do charge as a percentage of the estate. Um, but there's a lot of people for whom I say, look, you know, you really, you shouldn't pay me to set up a revocable trust. Um, there's a lot of people where it just, the, the benefit doesn't make much sense. There are, I have a lot of clients who, you know, I say, okay, these are the pros and cons, and basically one, one advantage of it is at, after your death, like the estate as a whole is going to save money because you're not shepherding it through probate. And sometimes that can be huge savings. You know, I did, I did a plan recently for my friend's parents um, who I charged them my normal rate, but, but they were appreciative anyway. Um, <laughs> The, uh, that's a joke, you guys. <laughs> um, the, they had five pieces of real estate in five different states. And they were just going to have everything passed by will. And it was, you know, two or three million dollar estate. It is. And they would probably have spent $100,000 on attorney's fees. Um, so instead, what we did was we set up a revocable trust and they just had lawyers deed all that real estate into, um, into the trust. And, and not only did they save, you know, did their kids save a ton of money, but um, they're, they're poor, you know, my, my friend from law school, who's their son and executor and trustee, I mean, I saved him years of life. <laughs> it would have been a disaster. Now, that's not the situation you're asking about. You're asking about a straightforward one. And sometimes in a straightforward one, you know, it's good enough and they don't really need it. But, but I'll, I'll still go through some of the advantages. So it avoids ancillary probate in other states. That's what I was talking about with the real estate. You have to open up a probate estate after your death, or somebody does, um, for any state where you own deeded real estate. <coughs> it's private for those who care about that. A will is a public document. Theoretically, anybody could go down to the Wyndham County Probate Court and say, I'd like to see the will of so-and-so. Um, you know, I, I heard it's on the paper they just died. For most, most people I talk to, that's not really a big deal um, because most people don't really do that. But, but if that's a concern, it is private. Um, it avoids court supervision, as we've said. And, perhaps, you know, very importantly, this is your hand from the grave. If you don't have, um, you know, so for example, if your situation, if, if the kids weren't grown or weren't grown enough or weren't, weren't acting grown, <laughs> then only with the trust can you effectively hold on to the assets until such time as somebody thinks, the trustee thinks they're ready for it. If you don't have a trust and you just give property to, to kids outright, or let's say if unexpectedly one of your children has died leaving grandchildren, then the, um, th that beneficiary comes into full ownership of whatever property he or she inherits at age 18. So let's say you've got a simple situation with grown kids 
and grandkids. And then uh, your grown kid dies with five-year-old kids, and each of those kids, at that point, um, through the beneficiary designations, it defaults to the estate, and they end up getting it that way. They're going to get that money at age 18. A trust can protect against that. It's not a terribly likely outcome. What's that? Whereas a will doesn't. A will does not. Anything that they come into really in any way other than a trust that I can think of, okay. they have a legal right to take it all at age 18. Um, so, yeah, a lot of times it's those unexpected situations. Um, let me think of another situation where, uh, yeah, so the minor children or the younger children. You know, so with a trust, you can say in your trust, um, a beneficiary has, if, if they come into a share younger, then at age 30, they have the right to take a third of their share. At age 35, they have a right to take half of the rest. And at 35, or at, at 40, they take all the rest. Um, and, and meanwhile, that whole time, until the final distribution, the trustee, whoever you name, has the discretion to be able to distribute from that share of the trust for that child for college, for living expenses, to help the guardian if the guardian isn't the trustee with you know, rent or raising them up and, or camps or, or weddings or business ideas. So the money's not tied up. It's just that it, it, the child doesn't have the right to, to demand it until whatever ages you specify. Um, the drawbacks are it's this expense up front. Yeah? To go back to what she said, if the, if the child dies, and he's married, or vice versa, does the home and stuff go to his spouse if it's not in a, a trust? It would normally default to his estate. And then if he had a will um, and said everything goes to my spouse, then it would. Um, if he didn't have a will... No, no. His wife. His wife. Oh. See, we... If, the child's so wife. So what you would say is, if your son died and he has a wife and a child, you yeah. would say if if the the father died, the son dies first, then it goes to the child, right? You specify that in your will. Yeah, that's how most wills yeah. most wills pass it down the bloodline, and, yeah. and frankly, most trusts do as well. Yeah. You can you can write in if you really like the spouse, or you want them to pay you a lot of attention, and you can let them know you've done this <laughs> for now. Um, <laughs> You, you can specify the spouse, and I've done that sometimes at clients' request. But usually you would, you would, it would go down the line. But if you, um, if you don't, the, the example I was trying to get at is if you don't specify in your will, and, 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 and somebody, um, and, and then it just defaults to them, let's say by beneficiary designation. So I've got a, a retirement account. And I say, I've got two kids, and I name those two kids, and one of them dies. There's two possibilities there, both of which can result in unexpected outcomes. And the more money there is, the bigger a problem this potentially is. Outcome number one is um, that, that beneficiary designation form for Fidelity or whatever the company is um, says, uh, if you name two children as your beneficiaries and one of them dies, everything goes to the other one. A lot of them say that. Hmm. So you need to look at these forms. It's another risk of these beneficiary designations. Hmm. So there, you've not only disinherited, you know, the, you've disinherited those grandchildren who have also suffered by losing their parent just because that was how the company set up the form. Maybe they didn't give you that option or maybe it wasn't clear. The other option is, um, you know, well, there's three options. Another option is it goes... The, that form says if one of these beneficiaries predeceases, it goes down the bloodline. But there, let's say it's a $500,000 you know, life insurance policy or IRA, and it goes down the line. When it hits the name of that child, who's now four, that child's going to get that plus all the appreciation on their 18th birthday. Um, and whether or not, whether you've done a will or whether you've done beneficiary designations, only with the trust can you protect against that. And that you're okay with them getting it at any Exactly. Yeah. And then your job is to spend while you're alive, so it's not an issue. Um, any other questions on that? Um, 
So, and sorry, I forgot to hand out those handouts. I printed those out. Yeah. One quick question: If you have you mind your oh, child you. in a will, and that child dies before the grandchild is a certain age, do you, does does your child want to have a trust then? Um, okay. Well, usually it would be you setting up the trust. Right. And, and so your child has died, and your trust says, if my child has died, then the share passes down to that child's children, but they can't get at it by right until they're much older. What about the spouse then? That's, that was my point. What happens if my child dies, mm -hmm. and he has a younger child and a wife, but what happens if I don't want his wife to get my money. Well, if your will says, it gets trickier. You have more control of the trust. Let's say you do a simple will. Um, your will says, uh, it goes to my child, my son, and if my son doesn't survive me, then to his children. So legally, your grandchildren will come into that share, not the spouse. Okay, that's just on a... That, that's a will. will. Yeah. But, the court is going to appoint a guardian for those children and a, and a conservator for that property. Chances are the person in charge of that money for the children is going to be the spouse. Whereas if you set up the trust and say, you know what, um, my, my son's wife is the greatest mother in the world and she bakes the best cookies, but she can't handle a dollar. You know, she's a good person, but she can't, she can't manage money or can't manage this kind of money. You can have the money held in trust for those same beneficiaries, the, the grandchildren. But you pick somebody else to be the trustee who's really good with money. And then that person just gives money as needed to, to the wife. And she doesn't control it. And, and, and she focuses on raising them. She gets a lot of money to help her do that from the trust. But ultimately, that money is more protected for the kids. So these questions, whether it's, you know, when you're looking at a question of who should be the trustee of a trust, which may be... Well, uh, finish this in a second. That's an important decision, and that's worth some discussion. You can have a family member, uh, a friend, you can have a, a spouse, and, and, you know, second marriages are really complicated. You need to really talk with somebody like a lawyer who does this a lot to think about things you should be thinking about. Um, and, and, or, or should it be a bank? Or like, I'm a huge fan of the Trust Company of Vermont. I think they do a great job. And at a very reasonable cost. They don't pay me to say that. I have fought banks in New York. The, you know, I won't say a name, but it rhymes with Morgan Stanley. Um, <laughs> I mean, just don't ever please name those banks as, as trustees. And if you already have them as trustees, I'm sorry. I've just had some really bad experiences with them. Um, if, I'm, if I'm designating a professional trustee like Trust Company of Vermont, I almost always... Uh, persuade the client to put in a line saying, if for any reason all beneficiaries unanimously wish to replace this trustee with another corporate trustee for any reason, they can do that. Mm -hmm. And that can be very useful. Because what happens is, you know, the larger the trust, the more the bank wants to fight to stay as a trustee. And, and if they win, they can use those trust monies to, to, to fight the legal costs and wear you down until you give up. It's really... And they charge a fortune. Um, you still need a will. Will we talked about that? Pro, uh, pour over. We were talking earlier about IRAs. They're really complicated. There's a lot of issues. Frankly, a lot of attorneys don't understand some of the complexities. Um, you can name your trust as the beneficiary. If you have, I've done this with my with my kids. Um, uh, you name the trust as the beneficiary, and then it can hold on to their required distributions that they would otherwise get. There's really, there's a lot of issues around that decision. Um, a lot of tax questions, it's very complicated. Um, make sure your beneficiaries for IRAs are updated. Consider designating charities. You know, unless you have a Roth IRA where the withdrawals come tax-free, they're great, by the way, uh, Roth IRAs if you can fund one. Um, IRA distributions are taxable income. If you decide that you want to um, benefit a particular charity like Putney Cares, 
for example, <laughs> or the library, uh, then you can take some portion of an IRA, a certain percentage, and designate the charity as the beneficiary. And what's great about that is um, the charity gets that, those shares or whatever that investment is, and they cash it out and they never pay tax on it. Um, and if, so if instead, you know, I've seen a lot of times where people say, I give X dollars to this charity and I give this other money to my kids. You know, if you flipped it around, um, you, you're, you're, you can come out ahead and, and benefit everybody. Anyway, um, so get good advice. Just if you're doing anything with your IRAs, just make sure you're talking to people who do it a lot. Um, I, I'm, I, I won't have time to go into that anymore. So estate taxes. Um, these the rich have very good lobbyists, and so what used to be a six hundred thousand dollar threshold is now five point three four million, and it's indexed for inflation. So it's probably be five point four three million next year. If you die with less than that amount at your death, your estate pays no estate taxes. Um, and so for, I wish I could remember the percentage, it's a very small subset where this is an issue. Um, but for those for whom it is an issue, there's still a lot of planning we can do to, to minimize, even if you owe taxes because of the estate taxes, there is a lot that can be done to minimize or eliminate taxes. Um, there's no tax on amounts that you transfer to your spouse at death or before. Um, there's no tax. Your, your taxable estate is reduced by the size of any um, charitable bequest. Um, and, uh, and there's no inheritance tax in Vermont. Um, so there are a handful of states that, that tax the beneficiary of a, a, of a large estate. Uh, so Vermont's not one of them. Um, so, if, you know, so, so the maximum rate is 35 percent. Uh, the, the interestingly, when the, you know, we had, there was a big controversy, as people may have known. Uh, you know, this was in flux for a few years. Now it looks fairly settled for now. But everybody, when you read the newspaper, everybody was focused on this. The real lobbying money, and I've got, I, I used to be, you know, I used to work on Capitol Hill. I've got nothing against lobbyists. Um, this was where the real money was. Because if you own, you know, if you're a billionaire, you don't really care about that. You care very much what that looks like. And so that got reduced. You know, back in the old days, that was an 80, 85, 90% maximum tax. Um, wow. So very interesting. Um, now here's the problem for a lot, of my, a lot more of my clients than my clients. I have clients who, are, who have taxable estates that are subject to federal estate tax, and we plan around that. This is a, a bigger problem. Um, 2.75 million per person. And, uh, and so you think, well, if you have a husband and wife and if everything goes to the spouse, um, you know, you could say, well, I have, I've got 3 million and my spouse has 3 million. And so there's no gifts between spouses. So when I die, everything goes outright to my spouse. There's no taxes due. Problem is the spouse at her death, she's got 6 million, uh, which is a whole lot more than 2.75 million. So she pays ca uh, tax on, on that amount over. Now, depending on how you look at it, the first dollar over 2.75 million tax at your death is taxed at 40%, which is a huge hit. It's what we, it's what we call it a cliff. As you know, the, the, the policymakers up in Montpelier say, well, it's not really 40%. Because you're taxing 2.75 million, it's more like 18% on the whole. But if you go one dollar over, it, should, <laughs> it feels like 40%. Um, and, and the higher you go, the lower that rate is until it maxes out around 16, 17%. Yeah. Now you just said there was no inheritance tax in Vermont, didn't right. you? What's the difference between inheritance tax and estate tax? Thank you. Um, estate tax is on the, the estate of the person who died. And I, that means a state, whether or not it's in trust. What they had, what they owned and controlled at their death. An inheritance tax could be a tax on each of the children who receive. Um, and, and so that might be very different. 
And in fact, some states have you know, inheritance taxes on a lot less than, than that amount. Yeah. Is the inheritance tax based on where the recipient lives or? Okay. Yes. So if I have if I have parents in Massachusetts who live and reside in Massachusetts, they pass on, and I'm a Vermont resident, and I get the money. I don't. I'm subject to the Vermont inheritance tax, not Massachusetts. That's right. Okay. Now Massachusetts, I think, has a million dollar state tax threshold. In Rhode Island, it's six hundred thousand. Hmm. And, uh, and New Hampshire has no estate tax. So I, ha I have counseled several of my clients that their decision not to move across the border is costing them around three or $400,000. I, I said that to somebody today, probably a $300,000 hit. And she said, you know what? Vermont needs the money. <laughs> and that's great, Sweet. you know? Um, so everybody needs to make a different decision. But, but for a lot of my clients in this, you know, who are gonna be hit with this, the, the simplest thing, and they don't even have to pay a lawyer, is to just establish residency in New Hampshire. But if you're like me, I, you know, I don't want to do that. I, it's not a problem for me. <laughs> I don't have that. But, um, but anyway, so you can use trust. So the way, there are a lot of ways to minimize state or federal taxes. It gets very complicated, um, and there's big dollars at stake. But the there, there are some classic tried and true ways of using trusts um, to, to minimize or eliminate taxes. Do I have a slide on that? Um, the, the, basic, the basic idea is if I put my 2.75 million on, I have 2.75 million, my wife has 2.75. If I put mine in my at my death in a trust, my wife, who still has her 2.75 million, she can get all the income generated from my investments, the interest and dividends, um, but she can't herself take the principal. Another trustee can give her some, but not too much of the principal. She could give herself as trustee some, but not too much of the principal. What that means, according to the IRS, is that at her death, she didn't have enough control over my trust for it to be really taxed as hers. So it stays subject, my 2.75 million, plus any subsequent growth the rest of her life, at her death, passes down to my kids, state tax free, federal or state. <coughs> and hers, whatever she has, if she's below 2.75 million, that passes to the kids. So you avoid a whole lot of estate tax that way. Whereas if I just say I give everything to my wife outright, at her death, she's got way too much money, she pays tax. That's the, the traditional classic approach, and it still works. What makes it really complicated now is decisions you make, the, the, the state, because of this disconnect between the state threshold and the federal, state hold, uh, federal threshold, there's also different rules about how you get around it. And essentially what it comes down to right now because of the way our laws are drafted and they're badly drafted in Vermont is under a lot of circumstances, surviving spouse has to choose, or you have to choose when you're setting up these documents, are you gonna pay a, a, state, a, a state tax now to try to minimize federal estate taxes later on or not? It's a really tricky decision. That's as much as I'll say about that. Um, gift taxes, these are commonly misunderstood. I'll take just a second on these. Everybody says, well, I can give 10,000, they all, and now it's 14,000, it went up a few years ago, and it's now infl indexed for inflation. Everybody says, okay, if they know the 14,000 figure, they, says, they say, I can give 14,000 in a particular year to any one person, and my spouse and I can double up, so we can give 28,000 to any one kid. But if we give any more than that, we're gonna pay gift taxes, so we can't do that. That's a common misperception. In fact, let's say you give uh, instead of 14,000 to a kid, you give 15,000 to a kid or to a friend that year. Your $1,000 over the uh, annual gift tax exclusion amount. That means that your lifetime gift tax exclusion of 5.34 million has been reduced by 1,000. So for most people, you can give, 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 you know, give away everything. Nobody's going to pay any gift taxes. But if you, give, if you give more, it does reduce your estate tax exclusion. So if you're anywhere near the 5.34, or for that matter, the 
and you give more than you, you, the safe harbor is that 14 it doesn't impact if you give more you start chipping away at those exclusions because not only is your lifetime gift tax exclusion reduced your estate tax threshold gets reduced by that reportable amount over the 14 clear on that what's the last um Oh, if you if you do the Vermont will and add your child onto the deed, that's a gift of half the value of the house. Hmm. So. so then, do they have to pay that tax? Then is that what you're saying? Not unless you have more than five point three four million. Right. So theoretically, you're supposed to file a form with the IRS. But where it really becomes a big deal, and we'll sh I'll show you in a minute, is with the Medicaid rules. So we'll talk about that. Yes. Mm -hmm. Is an amount paid to a third party on behalf of a child, like an educational institution, is that a gift? Good question. Um, this, the, the IRS tax code, the tax code, carves out a couple exemptions for this, from this $14,000 uh, rule. Um, if you pay directly for costs of tuition, not give it to the child and have the paid tuition, if you pay directly, it's not subject to that $14,000 limit at all. It's all excluded. Um, similarly, if you pay health care costs directly for, I believe it's a dependent, that's excluded. That's not subject to the $14,000. But for anything else, it is. And, and if they can't get at it right away, then it might be subject to gift taxes. So if you do a kind of a trust where they can't get at it, I probably shouldn't even mention that. Everything's more complicated than it looks. Other questions on that? How are we doing for people's tolerance and patience? I've got about 10 more minutes, if that's right. Um, so this is a really big problem and issue for a lot of my clients. Um, and you know, statistically, for a lot more people, obviously, than are worried about estate taxes. Um, if you're going to get advice, make sure you're getting good advice. Because I see Dave Warner in the back, who's a long-term care expert, and he will know that um, there's so much misinformation uh, about the Medicaid rules and what you can and can't do. And if you mess it up, it can really be consequential. Um, you know, I, every now and again, I'll get a call from, from one of the local banks saying, um, yeah, we've got somebody who wants to put all, move all of her bank accounts into her kid's name. And uh, we'd like you to, we, you know, we suggested she give you a call. Um, there are very few attorneys in Vermont who understand this issue. So I'm going to toot my own horn there. Uh, I'm a member of the National Academy. I'm president this year of the Vermont chapter of the National Academy of Elder Law Attorneys. There's a lot of lawyers who would draw you a will. There's a lot of lawyers who really don't understand how these work. And there's a lot of accountants. I've, I, I gave a talk not long ago at Pichek and Company to say, if your clients want to make a gift, you might want to tell them what the Medicaid consequences are. So, Medicaid planning. Medicaid, not Medicare, unfortunately, they're very close in name. Medicare is a program that will pay a Social Security recipient for <coughs> hospital costs, doctors, you know, under the right circumstances, drug costs. Um, Medicaid is the payer of last resort. Medicare will not cover more than the first 100 days in a nursing home. Medicaid will cover everything, a lifetime in a nursing home, if you otherwise qualify. And we'll talk about what that means. So, there are certain assets that are excluded. You can have these assets and still qualify for the government to pay for your nursing home care. You can have equity in your home, your primary residence, not a rental property, up to $500,000. That's that's equity in your home and any adjacent land. Yeah. On the home part? Yes. Yeah. Are we talking as a, if you own it with your spouse? What? The, the 500,000 is each spouse, so it's a million dollar property? No, it's just so it's just a property, property owned by you or you and your spouse. So $500,000 per property. Okay. And and you know, if, if you each had separate primary residences, as I saw recently, a married couple, I thought that was interesting, um, <laughs> then uh, you, they could each have 500. Um, actually, I'm, come think about it, I'm not sure about that. I'd have to look at that. Um, so each spouse gets one car of any value. Theoretically, it could be a Ferrari. 
<laughs> don't try it. You know, the, if, if they're going to crack down, that's, they're probably waiting on that. Um, as long as the rule says, uh, as long as it's at least occasionally used for your transport. So you have as much idea as I do about what that means. You know, if, is it enough to drive grandma around the block a couple times, uh, you know, a month and, say, and exclude the car? Yeah, it's a depreciating asset. You're not going to save a fortune there, but it's an excluded asset. Each spouse can put, uh, and by the way, that doesn't include vans or trucks, unless that van or truck is needed for that spouse's transport. So, you know, the truck, enough said. Um, each spouse can have a burial fund or funds allocated toward burial and funeral and related costs. So, you know, the cost of a headstone, if you pre-bought a headstone, um, you subtract that value from the, or a cemetery plot, you subtract that from the $10,000 value. Um, this is a huge one. IRAs being drawn down at the proper rate. So this varies by state. All this Medicaid stuff varies tremendously by state. Vermont is very generous in what they let you do compared to New Hampshire or Massachusetts. If you have a million dollar IRA, well, it's, let's call it a $500,000 IRA. Um, starting at age 70 and a half, you're required to draw down these required minimum distributions according to the IRS. <clears throat> Medicaid says your IRA is excluded <coughs> excluded as an asset. Um, sorry. <coughs> Thank you. Um, as long as you're drawing it down in that given year. So once you take out the minimum distribution, there could be $500,000 left, but it's off the table. It doesn't count. It's as though you don't own it. Now, the catch is that Social Security has a different life expectancy table than the IRS, which assumes you'll die much sooner, which means you have to draw it down much faster. But given the alternative of having to draw it down, it's pretty good. So you can have substantial assets in an IRA. You, you draw them down, and you know every month you take out that percentage you're supposed to take. You pay it over to the nursing home. Medicaid makes up the difference. Um, so there's this resource limit on, oh, and household goods are excluded. You know, if, if it starts looking more like a Gauguin collection, then it's really not a household <laughs> good, it's an investment. Gold coins can fall in that realm if disclosed. Um, so then resource limits. So those are all excluded assets. Resource limits. If one person is applying to Medicaid, they can only have $2,000 in countable assets. That's been the case since the 70s. The, their, their lobbyists aren't as good as the, the estate tax lobbyists. Two spouses on Medicaid, you have 3,000. But let's say you have one living at home and one spouse on Medicaid. Together, you can have $119,000 in countable resources. So you exclude the home, you exclude the IRAs, you exclude a car each, um, and then you spend down to around $119,000. That includes anything you can sort of get your hands on, life insurance policies you can cash out, you know, non-retirement account investments. But the idea is, and it makes perfect sense, they don't want to bankrupt the, the spouse who's staying at home and then have the state have to support him or her. So they let the other spouse have some. And the way it works is, it's not, the problem usually isn't an income problem, it's a resource problem. Because as long as, you know, a nursing home costs about $100,000 a year now. Um, as long as you're making less than that in income, then whatever income you have, if you're making 60000 in income uh, from Social Security and a pension or whatever, that money's just going to go to the nursing home if you're in the nursing home. Medicaid makes up the difference. So the problem getting somebody to qualify isn't typically the income, it's the resources. It's meeting, meeting this test. What's, give an example of accountable asset. Cash, checking account, um, stocks that aren't in a retirement account. A life insurance policy with a face value of more than $1,500. Um, the thinking being, well, if you can get at it pretty easily, you ought to get at it, sell it, and spend it down. Yeah. Now, I've heard of people that um, had over the $119,000, so the spouse that was at home wants the one to be qualified for Medicaid, so they divorce each other. Yeah. I have not yet done that or had a client who wants to do that. I'm sorry? I saw an AARP magazine. Yeah. What was the question? Um, 
does it make sense to divorce, to divorce a spouse? Oh. Um, so the other one can go on Medicaid. Part of the problem with that is that I think, you know, if, if unless the assets got split fairly evenly, um, then the, if Medicaid looks at that, they're going to say, well, wait a minute, this, this is a sham transaction. Um, so essentially the, the spouse who's going to the nursing home really effectively made a gift to the other one. And so we're going to, because there's this look back period on gifts, which I'll show you, that would disallow it. So that, cause, that prevents it, I think, as a practical matter in most cases. Um, but I've definitely, I've, I've talked about the divorce question with clients where one of the spouses has, you know, Parkinson's, it's just starting or, or that's halfway through. And so they know they have time and there are maybe some other valid reasons for a divorce anyway. You know, if you do it sort of at the last possible second and then one spouse gets it all and the other just happens to be the one in the nursing home, I don't think it would work. Yeah. <clears throat> Can you get away with reducing the equity in the home? Let's say the home is going to go to the child anyway. Can you gift or put the child on the deed uh, so that the equity becomes less than 500000 Well, I think, so that brings us to the look back period. Mm -hmm. um, there's a five-year look back period on gifts. Adding a child to a deed is a gift. Um, <clears throat> giving them anything for less than equal fair market value is a gift. Or, or anybody for that matter. Other than spouses. This doesn't apply to spouses. And um, the way it works is, let's say you give $100,000 to your kid. Or for that matter, put them on the deed of a $200,000 house as an equal owner. Um, and then four and a half years later, one of you, you or your spouse, or just you if it's just you, applies for Medicaid. Medicaid says, in the last five years, have you given away anything of value? And they'll look at bank accounts to, to see this. And you say, well, yeah, yeah, four and a half years ago, I did give $100,000 to my kid. Um, they will say, we're going to penalize you for that because we can't have that, right? Um, so we're going to make you ineligible from the date of the application for the period of time that that gift would have covered you in a nursing home, oh, wow. which is about a year. Mm. So that's the consequence. Now, if the kid gives back the 100000 you're okay. At that point, you spend it down or you do some other uh, approach. You know, if, if, uh, if the house has a mortgage, you pay the mortgage, maybe you buy some adjoining land. I've done that before. Um, but if the child's unable or unwilling to give it back, I had a client where, um, and I'm running out of time to be able to give war stories. I had a client where that was an issue. It was really interesting, but I can't <laughs> keep it. Is, is yeah. there a thing called the ladybird deed? Yes, and I'm just going about to talk okay. about it. Uh, and nobody has any idea why it's called the ladybird deed. Ladybird Johnson. There's no Didn't evidence they ever did this. have to do with Lyndon Johnson? Well, nobody knows. No? Is the thing. No? Okay. <laughs> um, so, so there's no charitable exception. Now, theoretically, there, there's a hardship exception here, which is really not um, invoked, not allowed very often. Um, but, but really, there's a strong presumption, if you've given away anything of value in five years prior to the date of application, that it was to avoid Medicaid. Uh, people often say, well, but I can still get 14000 a year, right? Wrong. It's an IRS rule. It's got nothing to do with Medicaid. Theoretically, $1 of a gift is a pen, you know invokes a penalty. So in other words, spending down, spending is fine. It doesn't have to be on your health care. You can buy a cruise, you can <laughs> I read recently um, somebody said, you know what? Just take he would love to, to suggest to a client that the client just takes all the money, goes to, to Vegas, puts two hundred thousand dollars on a red thirty seven, and if he wins he, he's, he can afford the best care the rest of his life, and he loses. He hasn't gifted. He's just spent it, and by God, he's eligible. <laughs> but, um, gifting is bad. Spending for any reason is fine. They don't, they don't have a problem with that. Um, so, for example, you know, one of the things we do is you spend on the house. If, you, if you're $50,000 over, you put money into the house. You fix up the roof. You, 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 know, you make it wheelchair accessible. You, 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 know, you build an addition, whatever it is. That's all okay because with the LBJ deed, we can protect the house. Um, but doesn't the spending have to be for yourself? You can't like pay your son's uh, $2,000 lawyer fee because he's getting a divorce. That's right. That would be a yeah. gift. Yeah. Whether you paid it to him or for his benefit. Yeah. So, yes. What if you pay mortgage? Uh, on, on a house your own, that's, that's fine. 
And so we do that, and that's a common, if you have a mortgage and you're going to a nursing home and you're over the limit and you're having to spend down, that's the first place you, you spend. Because we can protect the house. So this is the big, this is the big exciting news in Vermont. Um, it's, it's called a Lady Bird Johnson deed or Lady Bird deed, or it goes by a few different names. There no, there's no sanction name. It's a very odd concept, but bear with me for a minute. Um, there's no recovery until the second spouse dies. So if you own a, a house jointly with a spouse, and the first spouse goes in to a nursing home, um, as long as the second spouse, at the death of the first spouse, the second spouse is still living in the home or owning it, um, Medicaid doesn't come back and try to recover for the death of the first spouse. But let's say the second spouse then um, needs to go into a nursing home. Um, Medicaid can't touch your home, your primary residence, while you're still alive. Even if you're no longer living there. Because the test of whether it's your primary residence is a subjective one. Would you return to it as your primary residence if you could? Invariably the answer is yes. They can't touch it while you're alive. Upon your death, if it goes through probate, and it goes through your will, Medicaid files a claim in probate, and they force a sale if necessary, they get paid what they're owed, for covering you in a nursing home, and then anything left over can go to the family. Um, so the way you do this deed is you, um, it would look like if, if I'm married, um, my wife and I would say, we hereby deed our property to our kids. But we reserve for ourselves a life estate, meaning they can't ever kick us out, and we pay all the taxes and nothing really changes. And, and that's sort of an old-fashioned life estate deed, which really would be a gift of, of a remainder interest. But in addition, I reserve for our, we reserve for ourselves all rights of ownership, including the right to sell it and keep all the money, the right to deed it back to ourselves or to anybody else, the right to mortgage, lease, sell, convey. Um, in other words, you're, you're, it looks like you're giving it to the kids, but you're really then taking it all back. And, and the best way I can describe it is, it's as though you're naming the children as beneficiaries on the face of the deed. So just as your children have no ownership of a life insurance policy you own just because they're named beneficiaries, they have no ownership of your home. You've just named them beneficiaries. And if they go through a divorce, they, they've got nothing that they can access. And um, it doesn't trigger the five-year look-back period. You know why? You haven't made a completed gift, because you can undo it by yourself with no say from the kid. Any more than naming them as beneficiaries on a life insurance policy is gifting them the policy. No, you've just said, if I die and I haven't changed anything, you'll get it then. So it doesn't trigger this look-back period. You can do this while you're on Medicaid. Um, and then, because Vermont is one of the few states that only seeks recovery against probate assets, at the moment of your death, of the death of the second spouse, it passes automatically to the kids outside of probate. Medicaid currently only seeks recovery against probate assets. Mm. There's no tax implications to do this. We talked earlier about stepped up basis. You still get a step up basis in the house. It's, it's great. Is, yeah. it, is it the same thing as putting your house in a trust? No, because it's the same effect in that it avoids probate at your death, yeah. which I think is what you're looking at. Right. But Medicaid's rules say <coughs> if you apply for Medicaid and you have your house in a revocable trust, you have to pull it out of the trust because we want to get at it. Mm -hmm. But then you can do this deed. Now, I think there's a good chance in the future that this deed won't work. Uh, Medicaid's already talking. By the way, none of this is sort of secret. It's all, you know, when we apply, we say, here's the deed we did, and they say, yep, it meets the criteria. <coughs> so if I'll answer those in just a second. If you do the deed, and then later on, they change the rules and say, we're not going to really let you do this anymore. Um, there's two possibilities. One is, which I think is the most likely outcome, they grandfather anybody who's done the deed. And then you're home free. Mm -hmm. Worst case scenario, they only grandfather you if you've done the deed and applied for Medicaid. And if you haven't, then that worst case scenario, you're back where you started, you paid a few hundred dollars for a deed, you tried, but there's no real big loss. You did what you could. Yes? Uh, I was confused because I thought you were already allowed a $500,000 house 
exempt from Medicaid? You can get Medicaid while you're alive owning a $500,000 house, but they'll take it at your death. Oh. Oh. Sorry, I wasn't clear on that. Oh. If it goes through probate. Mm -hmm. and, and they're on to the trust idea. Okay. And by the way, let me take 30 seconds to say, some people find this unseemly. I, I mean, I do, I do really, you know, sanctified, long, long established state planning and trust for, um, you know, well established clients. I feel really good about this work. Um, and my thinking on it is, and part of why I justify it is, telling, not telling a client that they can do this is, is like telling them, you know, you, you, you really shouldn't take that mortgage interest deduction on your taxes. Sure, the tax law says you can do it, just like these laws say you can do it, but it's really just not right. The government needs the money, you should really give it to them. Um, and, and so part of, you know, I, I think as long as this is allowed and it's fully disclosed, I think, I think it's entirely appropriate to do. And I can do a, a trust and save somebody millions of dollars or hundreds of thousands of dollars easily. And yet so I've got a client who is middle class, has saved their whole life, and they just want to be able to pass something on to the kids if it's allowed by the rules. I feel really good about helping them do that. My last example on that is, you know, you can smoke your whole life, even if you know it's terrible for you. And Medicare, uh, the policymakers have decided, we'll pay for a million dollar lung extraction, reverse mm -hmm. something or other. Uh, heaven forbid, you're not lucky to get, you know, can lung cancer from smoking. Instead, you get Alzheimer's. Who is it for people to say, you know what, you really have a moral obligation to bankrupt yourself um, before you can avail yourself of what's allowed by the law? <clears throat> so that's my little pedestal. Yeah, um, you had a question. Yeah, yeah I don't and then understand. and then we'll do like two more minutes. I don't understand the principle of why the government would rather you blow all your money for the news than give it to somebody who needs it, like your kids or, or to, well, to, pay, to pay it down in any way you choose, rather than do something you think is constructive, like yeah. help out friends or kids or whatever. Well, most people don't bet it all on Red 37. I mean, most people, if they have the money, they'll spend it for, for their care, and, and that means the government doesn't have to pay for that. Um, but, you know, it's, it's, a, yeah, it's, it's policy decisions that were made a long time ago. Yeah. When is this something you think about doing? When you're at that point of your, your assets are down and you're, uh, you're thinking you're going to need Medicaid? I mean, this isn't something you just do Right now? I do a lot of these deeds. I probably do four of these deeds a month. And, and a lot of my clients are in their 50s and 60s. Because I do think that at a certain point, there's, it's, it's going to get disallowed. And if they get grandfathered, wow, they just spent a little bit of money and saved hundreds of thousands of dollars. And that's a pretty, it's pretty cheap insurance. I mean, you look about 36, 37. So I'm, I'm going to, so, so you've got time. Yes, so you've got time. But, you know, I, I think, you know, it's, it's worth considering earlier rather than later. It's not a last minute thing. No, in fact, there are things you can do in an emergency that I won't go into that you can do last minute. But a lot, a lot of this stuff is done better, is better done with, with some advanced warning. You have time, you know, you have time to make some gifts. I mean, like clients who have, you know, early onset of dementia, maybe they do want to take some portion, gift, gift something to their kids so they know it's safe and that they've got enough assets to cover them the, the rest of the five years. Yeah, last question for you. Going back to the beginning, what's the downside of, declare, of a child declaring himself the responsible party if a parent is going into a nursing home? Or, or, or a spouse declaring herself as, as a responsible party? The risk is that an aggressive nursing home could say that that was a commitment and an obligation on the part of that signator, that signer, to cover any shortfall for mom to obligate themselves to pay whatever bills out of the child's own money. But if, if the parent has dementia, let's say, how can, how can he or she be the responsible? Well, parent? as agent under power of attorney, or as sometimes it's necessary to be the guardian. But you just want to make, my point was just that if you're signing documents for the parent, you need to make sure that you have no, that nobody can make a claim that you have any personal obligation to make the nursing home whole if, if mom runs out of money and say Medicaid denies him for some reason. So just wrapping up, final thoughts, uh, life insurance, if, if, if there are minor children, um, frankly, 
you know, I think that might be important. If, 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 if you could, somebody has minor children or grandchildren, that may be important in any document, uh, more, doc, more important than any document I draft. Uh, I've seen some awful hardship cases where the dependent children just, you know, there was no life insurance and the surviving spouse is just looking at a lot of hardship. Um, I don't think I have this on here, but because but, I didn't really have time to talk about it, but um, long-term care insurance is something to consider. There's pros and cons, it's expensive, but if you have it and you need it, it's really valuable if you can qualify otherwise. So that's something to keep in the mix uh, other than just, you know, some Medicaid planning legal techniques. Um, I hate do-it-yourself do it yourself software. I'll just leave it at that. That goes back to the you don't know what you don't know. Um, and then just, you know, pick somebody who you trust, but also somebody who does this a lot, I think. More and more, whether it's medicine or, or, or law, it helps to have somebody who focuses in a particular area. Don't give me a call if your child gets arrested for drunk driving. I'm really, but but this, this is something I know something about. Leave that if you can read it with a final quote. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. So thank you very much. I'm sorry I went, a few, oh, I went many minutes over. Um, I'm happy to stick around and answer any questions you guys have. Thank you very much. Thank you. We're very glad you could come. Yeah, yeah. yeah. it's wonderful. Mm. So we'll uh, we'll wrap up. Anybody that likes to stay and help put chairs back can, but we realize that's not for everybody. Mm -hmm. We're going to do it. That was interesting. Oh, thank you. I, I have a quick question. Yeah. Um,